So Hebrews chapter one presents us with a very big picture of Jesus. He's higher than the prophets. He's higher than the angels. He's God's ultimate self-revelation. If you want to know who God is, you look to Jesus. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. He's created and sustained the universe. He has unique authority, identity, power. It's a big Jesus. But such a Jesus leaves us with a dilemma. The dilemma is, is captured, I think, in Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, we have the psalmist uh, beginning. He says, on this uh, note of worship, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now listen to what he says next. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor, you made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that swim in the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is all is your name in all the earth. The dilemma that the psalmist is sensing is this. God, you are so big. You are so majestic. The world that you've made is so awesome. What is man that you're, that you're mindful of him, that you think about us? that you crown us with glory and honor. It's, it's, it's a paradox. And so the question that we might have from the big Jesus of Hebrews chapter one, the question that we might naturally have is, yeah, I, I understand that Jesus is big, but, but, it, but can he identify with me? Can he really help me in my time of weakness? Can he really help me as I'm spending time in the desert places? Can that Jesus really identify with. And so it's no accident then that Hebrews begins this discussion in chapter two by quoting the words of Psalm eight. He says, he says at the end of chapter one, he says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who inherit salvation? Now, those who inherit salvation, that's talking about us. We're, we are those who will inherit salvation. And then if you skip down then to verse five of chapter two, here's what he says. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. Now, I believe that he's still talking about us there in verse five. So angels are ministering spirits sent to to serve us, those who inherit salvation. And then verse five, it's not to angels he's subjected the world to come. It's, It's us. But then he says in verse six, There is a place where someone has testified, and here he's going to quote Psalm 8 to us. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything underneath his feet. Put everything underneath his feet. Here's the big idea that I want you to catch from Hebrews chapter 2. Not only do we worship a big Jesus, we also worship a close Jesus. Hebrews chapter one is going to give us this really big picture of who Jesus is, but Hebrews chapter two is going to tell us, it's going to show us that this Jesus has also come near. This Jesus is also close to us and can identify with us and can help us. So he's identifying a problem here in, in chapter two, verse five, or I'm sorry, in chapter two, uh, verse eight, rather. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we don't see everything subject to him. There's the problem. The problem that Hebrews identifies is that even though we've been given these promises, we don't yet experience that. We don't yet see that in our lives. We've been given these promises, but we still experience struggle. We still experience heartbreak. We still experience frustration. The, The phrase that that theologians use to describe this is the phrase now, but not yet. We've received the promises of God. We we believe those promises of God, but we haven't yet experienced them to to their full consummation in our lives. That's, That's what Hebrews is getting at in verse eight. 
when he says, again, and putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Now, again, him there, I'm, I'm understanding that as referring to mankind. Yet at present, we don't see everything subject to him. At present, things are messed up. Things are severely broken. But then notice what he says in the very next verse. But we do see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews injects Jesus into the message of Psalm 8. And he says, Jesus has now come near. He has made himself Although he's higher than the angels, he has made himself lower than the angels so that, so that you and I could experience victory, so that you and I could experience hope. He entered into our experience and tasted death on behalf of everyone. Now the next, uh, the, the last part of chapter two just explains in greater detail um, the intimacy that we now get to experience with Christ. And I'm going to read this whole section, starting in verse 10. He says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am in the children that God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels that he helps but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to, the, to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, let me just outline a few things that this passage says clearly about Jesus. The first thing that it says about Jesus is that it says Jesus is our hero. The, the translation that I'm using translates it this way. Um, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. But the word author there, is, it's the word archagon in, in Greek. It means champion. It means hero. It means pioneer. Um, so Jesus is our hero, ushering us to glory. Now, glory, for, to a Jewish ear, glory meant the presence of God. So our hero is bringing us to glory. Our hero is, our champion is bringing us back to the presence of God. Um, so it identifies Jesus here as being our hero. The second thing that it says about Jesus in this passage is it also says that Jesus, oops, says that Jesus is our liberator. Jesus is our liberator says that he is freeing us from the bondage of the slavery of the fear of death. So he's rescued us from that fear. We no, longer, we no longer need to live under the chronic fear of death. Instead, we've been liberated from that fear because of what he's accomplished on our behalf. The third thing that he says, and he's going to return back to this over and over again in the book, is he identifies Jesus as our high priest. Now, he, he made mention of that in chapter one as well. In the beginning verses of the book, he says he's provided purification for our sins. He's returning to that idea in chapter two. He'll mention it again in chapter three, four, five, and this, this becomes a resounding theme throughout the book. But Jesus is our high priest who has made atonement for our sins. So three things. He's our hero. He's our liberator. He's our high priest. But the, the, the idea or the theme that unites all of these together is that Jesus identifies with us. Jesus identifies with us. 
because our hero, it says, the author of, of our salvation was also, in chapter 2, verse 10, um, it says, the author of our salvation was made perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus isn't a call, ashamed to call them brothers. So our hero is also our family. He says that, that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. That our champion, our hero, suffered on our behalf, but he's also one of us. He identifies with us as family, which is a, a remarkable thought. How many times in our lives you think about the heroes that people have, the heroes that young children have, and just how separate those heroes are from us, how separate those heroes are from our experience. Can they really understand and identify with my daily life, the things that I have to go through? It says of Jesus here that our champion, our hero, identifies with us as family, and he's not ashamed of us as his family, which is the most remarkable part. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He says of our liberator, our liberator was a captive himself. And what I mean by that is Jesus himself shared in our flesh and blood. He shared in our flesh and blood and he experienced death. And by experiencing death and overcoming death, he's able now to free us from that same fear of death. So our liberator was also a fellow prisoner. And he says of our high priest that our high priest making atonement for our sins is also subject to temptation himself. And because he himself was subject to temptation, he's able to be merciful and understanding to us in our temptation. So point after point after point, he's wanting us to know that this big Jesus who we met in chapter one is also a close Jesus, a close Jesus who identifies with us in every way. And so imagine you're struggling in your faith. Imagine how helpful and encouraging that would be to know that this Jesus that I've dedicated my life to, this Jesus that, you know, I've, it has cost me relationships. It has cost me trials and temptations and persecutions. This Jesus is, is big, but he's also close. He's intimate and he identifies with me in all of my weaknesses. He himself went through the trial and the desert just like I am. So as we close out this section, I want you to spend a little bit of time with Hebrews chapter two, meditating on it, thinking it through. And I'd like you to make your own list. What are the things from Hebrews chapter two that you learn about yourself? What are the things in Hebrews chapter two that you learn about what it means to follow Jesus? What it means to be a disciple? Um, for instance, when it says that we've been freed from the slavery of the fear of death, how does that, how does that strike you? Do you see evidence of that in your life? Do you see evidence of that freedom in your life, that, that you no longer live under the burden of that, of that constant fear of death? Um, just go through Hebrews chapter 2, making a list and make it personal. What, what do we learn about ourselves in relation to Jesus in chapter, in chapter 2? Um, the other thing that I would challenge you to think through is this. Going back to the now but not yet issue. We've received promises in Jesus. We've received promises, um, uh, promises that give us hope, hope for the present and hope for the future. The problem that we have so often is, is that our visibility gets in the way of our vision. Let me explain what that means. What I see, my visibility, the things that I see are constantly challenging my faith. They're, they're constantly discouraging me, constantly wearing me down. What I see with my eyes constantly tell me the word defeat over and over and over again. But what Hebrews wants us to do is he wants us to change our visibility into vision. Instead of being overwhelmed by the things that we see, he asks us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Remember who Jesus is. Remember what Jesus has done. He says, yes, Things in this world are oftentimes broken, but we've also seen Jesus broken on our behalf. And so one of the things that Hebrews 2 challenges us to do is it challenges us to trade in our visibility for our vision, to continue to focus on Jesus. And as we, as we close out this section on Hebrews chapter 2, 
I'd just like you to spend some time meditating and thinking that through. What does that mean? To, to really look at Jesus, to, to remember what Jesus has done for you on the cross, and how might that encourage you as you're living in this tension between the now and the not yet?